Hello, I'm Nicholas Bonsack, President and Head of Portfolio Strategy for Strategus, Baird's investment strategy arm. Last week, we closed with a reflection on long-term goals and the importance of not reacting to every piece of news that hits the tape and sends the stock market up or down, but rather to keep your financial endgame in sight and work with your financial advisor to react appropriately to the time ladder of risks and ensure you remain on track. While it may be an understatement given the vagaries of 2020, it strikes us that our ability to maintain this discipline, to keep our long-term goals in focus, will be put to the test over the next several months. While the broad market reaction in March and April was certainly more acute, understanding the why and the implications of why was far easier. We were reacting to the virus and the associated uncertainty that it presented. But six months on, there is less uncertainty. It appears society is learning to live with the virus, and investors are less prone to react to its every ebb and flow. This is not to suggest that the virus is no longer an issue, it is, or that the necessary point of care testing is available, it is not. It is certainly not to diminish the very real loss so many people have experienced at the hands of the virus. It is only to suggest investors' focus has shifted from one very overwhelming binary construct, the virus, to a menu of important issues, any one of which investors would typically digest with exhaustive care but for which they find they just don't have the time. But if we look through the noise, to the extent uncertainty from investors' point of view has abated and signs that the economy continues to gather momentum intensify, we should ask why investors are not universally more bullish. Part of the reason, in our view, would seem to be the firm grasp the competing all-or-nothing political outcomes have on investors' mindshare. While it is perhaps obvious that the volume of political vitriol and associated legislative jockeying would increase in an election year, that neither party appears willing to concede an inch in the obvious service of the common good leaves us with little hope that the election, regardless of the outcome, will foster a timely reconciliation on the pressing points of policy being debated. This is notable in two key areas that will likely have implications for the economic recovery and for our portfolios well beyond election day. The first is the natural tension inherent in weighing freedom versus safety, particularly as it relates to municipal lockdown and reopening. If you feel safe, it's unlikely you're entirely free. Conversely, if you feel free, it's unlikely you're entirely safe. And the second, which we discussed last week, is the size and target of additional fiscal stimulus. These strike us as important given the economy's arguable reliance on reopening and the provision of additional fiscal stimulus to recover more robustly. Perhaps investors are worried there's another shoe to drop. This is a natural concern, given what we've experienced during this pandemic. But it is also true that it is never more difficult to suss out the change in the economic winds than during the transition from recession to recovery. This is because the divergence between the trailing data reflecting the period just passed and the expectations for the future are at their widest. You can see this phenomenon here, where we chart the expected growth rate for S&P 500 earnings over the next 12 months by comparing the consensus next 12-month estimate to the trailing 12-month actual of the same. We call this the earnings curve, and one thing we noticed straight away is how much steeper the curve was coming off the lows in 2001 and 2008. The concentrated impact of the tech wreck and the asset-based impairment of the financial crisis set a far easier hurdle for recovery than the great lockdown of 2020. So this week brought the start of the third quarter earnings season, and we'll be paying particular attention to the top line. How successful were companies in rebuilding revenue during the quarter as the economic recovery gathered steam? We know subsidies resulted in lower income consumers ramping up spending rather quickly, while higher income consumption has not covered nearly as fast. So the net result will be an important signpost for the slope of the recovery. For the S&P as a whole, revenues are expected to decline roughly 4.5% year-on-year this quarter, with healthcare shaping up to be the strongest, up 8%, and energy the weakest, down more than 30 As you might imagine, we maintain overweight exposure to healthcare in our U.S. equity portfolios while we maintain neutral exposure to the energy patch, believing the worst is behind us. As we turn for home this week, we return to the calming guidance of long-term goals. Yes, earnings, elections, and darn near everything else can be a distraction, but let's focus on what we know and what conclusions that leads us to. While the V-shaped bottom in economic activity seen during the third quarter was almost a given due to the enormity of monetary and fiscal stimulus, a continuation of the V-shaped recovery is less certain. 
At the same time, it seems safe to assume the level of economic activity, output, and profitability will be higher next year than it was this year, this year, barring another global lockdown or policy error. What investors will pay for those earnings, however, is likely to confound traditional value investors unless the recovery can harness an organic driver of growth or two. We maintain above benchmark exposure to growth in our global tactical asset allocation portfolios. Stay focused. Stay healthy, and we'll see you again next week. As always, the Bear team stands ready to be of assistance, so please let us know how we can be, and have a wonderful weekend.